thank you all for being here. And I'd like to begin just um, with a hats off, really, to the team that has organized these incredible two days. So bear with me and give them all a hand. So now I'm the I'm Paul's you know nightmare because having been introduced this way I was going to walk through the case for why corruption can in fact engender religious extremism. It's a bit of a stump speech that I've uh, given over the last couple of years. But I have to say that as an American called upon to vote in a few days, I think I actually need to do something different this morning. When I started working on corruption uh, in Afghanistan in around 2005, I had been there at that point for about four years, I actually couldn't get anybody's attention. Later, Sarah, with your corruption thing, first we have to bring security. That's the reaction I kept getting. Well, how did that go? My argument was you're not going to get security in Afghanistan until you address the corruption problem. Well, what a difference a decade makes. Corruption has become central to the US political campaign this year. Who would have thunk it? Crooked Hillary, right? Well, I'm going to shock you this morning. Trump is right. The system is rigged. Now, of course, he's a demagogue. He's one of the major beneficiaries of the rigged system. But Let's just remember, if you take the Bernie Sanders voters and the Donald Trump voters, you've got about 70% of the US voting population who genuinely believes that corruption is one of the most significant issues in our political economy of our country today. Meanwhile, so while that's going on, while you've got that kind of a proportion of the US voters who are that seized with the issue, meanwhile, we have our Supreme Court, which recently struck down the corruption conviction of the, of the former governor of the state of Virginia. This guy had been arranging meetings for a businessman pal of his, you know, in return for Rolex watches, very expensive gi uh, uh, other gifts and trips for the governor himself and his wife, et cetera, et cetera. The con corruption conviction of that man was just thrown out by the Supreme Court um, uh, because allegedly he hadn't performed any official duties in return for these gifts, as though arranging a meeting in the governor's office isn't an official duty, meaning the definition of corruption now by our Supreme Court has been narrowed to the point that it practically has to be a, a, a contract signed between the bribe giver and the bribe taker, and the bribe taker literally has to either vote in a certain way or perform some other very narrowly defined official, um, uh, official quote, duty. Um, the fact that the Supreme Court threw out that corruption isn't enti wasn't entirely surprising to me. What was really surprising to me was the vote was unanimous. Nine justices out of nine voted this way. Not only did they all vote this way, there wasn't even an opinion. You know, often we have a concurring opinion in our Supreme Court where a justice might say, look, based on the way the statute is written, I was obligated to vote this way. However, here are some of the concerns that this raises for the health of our democracy. Nobody even wrote such a concurring opinion. And not only that, when you listen to the sort of ABC, meaning the kind of mainstream, even left-leaning media, uh, reactions to this. I remember a call-in show that's beloved in the city of Washington, D.C. and beyond. Um, all of the sort of pundits dismissed this. They weren't even interested in this decision. Um, and, and I remember some of them saying, gosh, well, you know, if that conviction had been able to stand, then most of the political practice in Washington would be equally liable to prosecution. And my answer is, well, exactly. That's why we have 70% of our voters really upset about this. 
Um, and that's why you are looking at what actually represents almost a revolt of the voters. Now, uh, just let me back up a second and say, I am not holding in equivalence the people who supported Bernie Sanders and the people who support Donald Trump. I do think that, that, that to some extent they are motivated by, a similar, by similar concerns. I'd like to just dwell for a moment on two elements of the epidemic of corruption that the world is facing today. I think that part of it resides in the role of money as a value that is, pun intended, trumping so many other values. I had a conversation about a couple of years ago with nieces and nephews between the ages of about 11 and about 18 at the time. We were talking about cheating in school. My oldest nephew of the group had conducted a poll for his journalism class in high school of how many students in that high school self admitted themselves to have cheated in school. Now, I'm not going to ask any of you in the audience to raise your hands, but he got in his poll 94% of the students in this high school. And not only that, as he looked at higher classes and honors programs, the higher the class and the, and the more significant the honors program, the higher the concentration of cheaters, which should have been the opposite. My youngest nephew, 11 years old, raised some really interesting questions like, well, is working together on a homework assignment, is that really cheating? And he, he, started, to, he started to launch that question. He says, you know, I understand cheating on a test. I mean, obviously that's cheat. Oops, I've done that. <laughs> so I say, why? And he said, to get 100%, to get into a good college, to get a good job. So what we were really grappling with there is in spite of the lip service paid to virtues like integrity, our society is not rewarding them. Money is becoming just about the sole yardstick of social um, achievement. Let's talk about the earth. I almost feel like we're in a situation where many of the members of our cultures are interested in converting the earth, what's on it, what's under it, the air, and people into cash. And those things that can't be converted into cash, what we need to do is either kill them or move them out of the way. Coal mining in my country, you know what they call the mountains? That they literally chop off the tops of the mountains in order to get at the coal? The mountain with its trees and its rocks and its streams and its animals and its, that's called, oh now I've forgotten the word actually, but it's uh, overburden overburden. Um, another point is economic growth. How many of you believe in economic growth? Do we want to have economic growth? Economic growth as an absolute good, in fact, it's a, it's a lie. It's a lie because the notion is that if we have economic growth, then the poor can be uplifted while the rich don't have to give anything up. So let's ask again, how well have we done with that? Um, my thought was always that unfettered growth, uncontrolled growth, is cancer. Why do we believe that on a finite planet, Economic growth is an absolute good. I mean, surely, and then you've got people with PhDs in economics who are telling us this every single day. Um, so that's one thing, money as a value. The second thing I'd like to touch on, and I think we may discuss it a little bit further uh, in the panel conversation, is systematization of corruption. So um, 
very often corruption is considered the poor behavior of some or even a large number of public officials, right? It's a kind of cancer, right? Or an epidemic or a corrosion that seeps into a system. I would like to suggest something pretty provocative, that it's not actually, um, it's not a behavior, it's, it's not the bad acts of individuals, it's in fact the operating system of sophisticated networks that bend government functions to their purposes. And those purposes are personal enrichment, not governing. Governing often is at best a kind of front activity designed to fool often international interveners, right? So what you're looking at is not so much fragile or failing governments where corruption seeps into the cracks in, in, in this fragile structure. Instead, it's the very successful activity of a criminal organization that is masquerading as a government. This type of behavior leads to extreme reactions, and no wonder. I mean, part of me, I lived in Afghanistan for about a decade, and at some point I started to say, anyone who wouldn't become violent, confronted with the type of behavior that we are witnessing every day, they're the ones who need their heads examining. Why do we expect Afghans not to be violent when subjected to this? So the extreme reactions that we've been seeing in the last decade in which the understanding of corruption has changed. Let's just look most recently. Broad popular protests in Brazil, Guatemala, Honduras, Iraq, Lebanon, Malaysia, Moldova, and I'm sure I've missed a few in the last year. These are massive popular protests, some of which have toppled governments. We have the revolutions of the Arab Spring in Ukraine, which then have devolved into really serious hard security crises. We've got militant puritanical religion, and, and that would have been my stump speech, but I'm gonna ask you all to buy Thieves of State, and then you'll get the argument in the book. But the fact is that militant puritanical religion is not only an artifact of how Islam is reacting to the corrupt governments of Nigeria, of Uzbekistan, of Afghanistan, of Iraq. But in fact, in our own political and cultural history of the sort of Anglo-Saxon, uh, if you will, uh, Northern Europe, uh, America and Canada and Australia, if you look back at the Protestant Reformation, at the English Civil War, at, at um, you know, the American Revolution, these were militant puritanical reactions to the sort of rigged system of the Catholic church-state combination. And if you, I would urge you all to go back and read the 95 Theses read the 95 Theses, it's all about corruption. Now, I'm not trying to say that there wasn't a spiritual dimension to this, but every element of doctrine that Martin Luther sought to change was a place the Catholic Church had a toll booth that they were collecting on people, they were shaking people down. And lest we forget, the Protestant Reformation was not a peaceful event. It was really bloody, it was really ugly, and in fact, they went after buildings. You know, as I started reading primary documents for uh, Thieves of State on iconoclasm and how not only did they knock the noses off of statues on the churches, they went after the linen, they went after the plate, they broke the baptismal fonts. Sometimes they hung those statues as though they were um, executing judgment on them. And I didn't realize that at that time the statues would be walked around in processions around town and they would be draped with the riches of the church, that the statues would be dressed in ermines and jewels and rubies and, and the people would be expected to line up and show reverence to these statues, whereas the people are understanding the money that got that I was shaken down for is what is on display here in these statues. And that made me think of the four-wheel drives in Afghanistan, the big luxurious houses. We all looked at uh, Yanukovych's pleasure palace when that went vi viral. Um, and so the attacks on these buildings also reminded me of the attacks of 9-11. I'm not trying to make an exact 
correlation here. But I do think the parallels are significant enough that we should pay some attention to them. Um, and finally, dangerous populism is another reaction to this type of rigged system. And that's what we're seeing, not just in the Trump campaign in the United States, but in Europe and many other countries as well. Um, on my way over here, I, read a, I saw on the airplane a documentary called Another Country about the Aboriginal, a particular Aboriginal community here. Um, and it made me think again about this issue of the say-do gap. I think that our verbiage on a lot of things has gotten, including corruption, has gotten better. But what I would like to urge in finishing here this morning is the need that we all have to renew, renew, renew other values, other than money, that we of the cash culture, we of the cash culture must have the patience and the humility to learn from our elders on these lands, Australia as well as America. And that means we are going to have to give some things up. Study after study show that the luxuries that we really do have to give up a little bit of, they are not things that really make us happy. That increased material pleasures and luxuries beyond a certain level are not correlated with increased happiness. And yet still we cling to these things. We need to live our interdependence. And that living of interdependence requires integrity, the title of this conference. You can't lie to people or to the land and expect them to come through to you. Um, interdependence needs to include not just homo sapiens that talk different or dress different or pray different, black fellows and white fellows, we also have to include in our interdependence the cranes and the lizards and the migratory fish and the mosses and the lichens and the rocks and the wind. I'm sorry to have learned this morning about changes, prospective changes to the biodiversity law here that would make it harder to challenge mining projects or dams. Unless we begin valuing all of those things and creatures as our family, and treating them as such in our deeds as well as our words, I'm afraid we, this little species of ours, may be doomed. Thank you.